Jesus Christ is the world's most intriguing person. On July the 11th, 1926, at a youth meeting at the Shrine Auditorium in Los Angeles, James Allen Francis, the pastor of the First Baptist Church of Los Angeles, said in a sermon what has become well known as a piece called One Solitary Life. You probably have heard it. It goes like this. Here is a young man who was born in an obscure village, the child of a pleasant woman, peasant woman, who grew up, grew up in another village. He worked in a carpenter shop until he was 30. Then, for three years, he was an itinerant preacher. He never wrote a book. He never held an office. He never owned a house. He never had a family. He never went to college. He never put his foot inside a big city. He never traveled uh, 200 miles from the place where he was born. He did one uh, more. Uh, did one of the things that unusually company. He did not do any of the things that usually accompany greatness. He had no credentials but himself. While he was a still a young man. The tide of public opinion turned against him. His friends ran away. He was turned over to the enemies. He went through the mockery of a trial. He was nailed to the cross between two thieves. While he was dying, his executioners gambled for the one piece of property he had on earth, his coat. When he was dead, he was laid in a borrowed grave through the pity of a friend. Nineteen hundred years have come and gone, and today he is the central figure of the human race and the leader of a, a column of, of progression. I am within the mark when I say that of all the armies that have ever marched and all the natives, uh, na navies that have ever sailed and all the parliaments that ever sat and all the kings who have ever reigned put together, have not affected the life of man upon the earth as that one solitary life. I say Jesus Christ is the world's most intriguing person. And that's only the beginning. Much, much more could be said. Much more could be said about this most intriguing individual. Trying to cover all aspects of him is like trying to cover all the books in the Huntington Library all at once. The Bible lists 250 names for Christ. Here are just a few. The Bible calls him Advocate, Adam, Apostle, Ancient of Days. The Bible calls him Bread, Bridegroom, Begotten of the Father, Brightness of the Father's Image. The Bible calls him Covenant. Counselor, Cornerstone, Christ. The Bible calls him Deliverer, Desire of All Nations, Door. The Bible calls him Everlasting Father, Eternal One. The Bible calls him the Forerunner, the First Fruits of Those That Sleep, Faithful Witness, Friend of the Church. The Bible calls him the Gift of God, Governor, Guide, and God. The Bible calls him Head of the Church, Horn of Salvation, Hearer of all things. The Bible calls him Emmanuel, Invincible, Inheritance, the I Am. The Bible calls him Jesus, the Just One. The Bible calls him King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, the Lamb, the Love, the Light, the Life. The Bible calls him Messenger, Messiah. The Bible calls him the Nazarene. The Bible says he is the only Savior, the Omnipotent, Omniscient One. The Bible says he's the priest, the prince of peace, the potentate, and the Passover. The Bible calls him the refuge, the resurrection, the rose of Sharon, and the redeemer. The root of David, the ransom, the rest. The Bible calls him the stone, the son of God, the servant, the seed of the woman, the savior. The Bible calls him teacher, tabernacle, tree of life, and truth. The Bible calls him the wonderful the witness, the word, the wisdom of God. And that is only the beginning. 
More could be said about Christ than any book or set of books could possibly contain. As a matter of fact, at the end of the Gospel of John, he said just that. The biblical teaching concerning Christ, however, can be simplified. It can be summarized in two basic points. What I've been doing these days is going through some of the basic truths of the Bible. We've talked about God the Father. And today I want us to talk about God the Son. When experts, so to speak, search what the Bible has to say about him, they boil it down to two basic things. If you understand these two basic things about Christ, you understand who he is and what he has come to do. As a matter of fact, those two basic things have to do with his person, who he is, and secondly, his work, the primary thing he came to do. So those are the two things I'd like for us to think about today. Let's start with who he is. The Bible says that Jesus Christ is God. Now that shocks some people because they're used to hearing that he is the son of God. And that's true. But when we call him the son of God, what we mean by that is he is God the son. Jesus Christ is the incarnation of God. Incarnation is a fancy 50 cent word that simply means in flesh. God took upon himself flesh, and we call him Jesus Christ. Now, there are all kinds of indications in the Bible that Jesus is God. There are some direct statements, and there are some indirect statements. We don't possibly have the time to look at all these passages, so I'm going to simply refer to a large number of them. Bear with me. The point is simple and singular. Jesus Christ is God. For example, he is called Emmanuel in Isaiah chapter 7 and Matthew chapter 1. The Hebrew word Emmanuel means God with us. What could be clearer? He is called Almighty God in Isaiah chapter 9. Now there are people who come to your house and knock on your door And if you talk to them, they will say that Jesus is not almighty God. He is mighty God, not almighty God, that he is only a God. And my response to them is simply this. The Bible calls God the Father, Jehovah God, almighty, as well as mighty. They need to read Jeremiah chapter 32. But one of the plainest statements in all of the Bible about who Jesus Christ is, is in John chapter 1, verse 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Then, in verse 14, it says, the Word became flesh. I don't know what could be clearer. The Word was God. The Word became flesh. That is Jesus Christ. And by the way, those same people who knock on your door, if you tell them that, they will say, Ah, but in the Greek text, there is no article. When they tell me that, I say, Do you know what my last name is? It's Kokoros. That's Greek. Here is a Greek New Testament. Would you mind showing me that? And of course they can. But they are accurate, by the way. There is no article in the Greek text. What they don't understand is that Koine Greek, the Greek of the New Testament, left out the article deliberately. And so this should be translated, the word was deity. This is emphatically declaring that Jesus Christ is God. That's one of those direct statements. There are others. In Philippians 2, 6, it says he was in the form of God. And the Greek word translated form means the essential attributes of God. 
Colossians 1.15 declares him to be the image of the invisible God. And the Greek word translated image does not just mean resemblance. Rather, he is a copy of God. As a die would mold a piece of metal so that it looked like it, then that's the word that is being used, meaning this produced its exact likeness. That's who Jesus is, the exact likeness of God. By the way, those same people I've referred to twice now will point out that in that same passage, he is called the firstborn, somehow indicating that he was created and not the creator. The problem with that view is if you just read the Bible, you would understand that firstborn is sometimes used of first in time, which is the way they're taking it, and it's also used of first in rank in Psalm 89, verse 27. And we know that that's the way it's being used in Colossians chapter 1, verse 15, because it goes on to say in the next verse, all things were created by him. Jesus is not a created being. He is the creator of all things. All things could not be created by him if he were created. 1 Timothy 3.16 says, God was manifest in the flesh. And somebody's going to say, ah, that's one translation, but another translation says he. And that's because they're using just a one or two manuscripts. The vast, vast majority of manuscripts of that verse that we have say God is manifest in the flesh. Titus 2.13 says, looking for that blessed hope and glorious appearing of our great God, even Savior, Jesus Christ. Titus 2.13 is calling Jesus Christ God. If the Bible is the Word of God, Jesus Christ is the Son of God, meaning He is God the Son. Now, I've just quoted a few of the direct references. There are many indirect references indicating that Jesus Christ is God. Consider some of his titles. He's called the Son of God, repeatedly. He is referred to as the Lord. Now, when he is called Lord, that means he's God. The Jews uh, didn't want to pronounce the personal name of God. Matter of fact, we're not sure how to pronounce it till this day because they didn't pronounce it and they didn't have vowels in their alphabet. So some call it Jehovah and others say it's Yahweh. Well, every time the Jews came to that word, they wouldn't pronounce it. So they used another Hebrew word, Adonai, which means Lord. So when a Jew called God Lord, uh, they were saying he's God. The New Testament takes that Jewish title of Lord, meaning God, and applies it to Jesus Christ. For example, Acts 16, 31 says, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved. The word Lord in that verse simply means that he is God. Isaiah 41, 4 refers to Jehovah as the first and the last. But in the book of Revelation, Jesus is said to be the first and the last. Also in the book of Revelation, something similar is said about the Alpha and the Omega. Not only are there titles attributed to Jesus that indicate that he's God, but so are some of the attributes given to him. The New Testament claims that he's omnipotent, Matthew 28, verse 18. Omniscient, John 2:24. Omnipresent, Matthew 28, verse 20. Immutable, Hebrews 13, 8. One authority has said, All nature, which like a garment he throws around him, is subject to change and decay. Jesus Christ is always the same. He never changes. Then there are his activities that portray his deity. He created the world, according to that passage I read earlier in John chapter 1. He forgives sin in Luke chapter 7. He is worshipped in Matthew chapter 2. When mere mortals were worshipped in the New Testament, 
they rebuked the worshiper. But when Jesus was worshiped, he did not correct the worshiper. In John chapter 20, Thomas said, my Lord and my God. And Jesus did not correct him. He accepted the recognition of who he was. Jesus Christ is either God or an imposter because of what he himself claimed. So the simple point I've made thus far about who Jesus is as a person is that he is God. Robert Browning is reported to have said, when Charles Lamb and some of his friends were discussing how they would feel if the greatness of the dead were to appear suddenly in flesh and blood, that Lamb himself said, if Shakespeare entered, we would all rise. If Christ appeared, we must kneel. We are standing in the presence of deity. Jesus is God in the flesh. Let me say a second thing about who he is, which ought to be obvious by this time, but it needs to be said. Jesus is God and Jesus is man. That's what makes him so unique. He became a man. Galatians chapter 4 said he was born of woman. Luke chapter 2 says he grew as a child. He must have had human appearance because he was recognized as a Jew by features and speech in John chapter 4. Furthermore, he experienced human needs such as hunger in Matthew chapter 4, thirst in John chapter 19, Sleep in Matthew chapter 8, being weary in John chapter 4, and even weeping in John chapter 11. No wonder he is called the Son of Man over 80 times in the Gospel of Luke alone, and referred to as the Man, capital M, Christ Jesus in 1 Timothy 2 5. And by the way, he is God and he's a man, and contrary to all those pictures you've seen, he did not have a halo. He appeared as a man. He walked around as a mere man, and that's what makes him so unique. So in short, Jesus Christ is God and man. He is called the Son of Man and the Son of God. There is none. No one in all of history quite like the God-man, Jesus Christ. If the Bible is the word of God, Jesus is God in the flesh. I said there were two things about Christ that summarize him and what the Bible teaches about him. The first is who he is. He is God in the flesh. The second thing we need to know about him is what he came to do. Now, if we just took what the Bible says about him, we'd be here not just for the rest of the day, perhaps the rest of the week, but for the rest of the month. Four books in the Bible are written to tell us about what Jesus did. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. We cannot possibly cover all of that. But what we can do is this. We can look at those four books and say that of all the things that he did, of all the miracles he performed, of all the speeches that he gave, what apparently the Bible wants us to know is basically two things. Namely, that he died and that he arose from the dead. Because if you read the Gospel of Matthew, the bulk of the material is at the end of his life, of all the days, there was more attention given to the last week, his crucifixion and his resurrection. And the same is true of Mark, the same is true of Luke, and the same is true of the Gospel of John. So these are the two things you need to know about Jesus Christ, that he died and that he arose Frankly, this is a personal comment. Doesn't matter to me what else you believe about the Bible or don't believe. I sometimes tell people, I don't care whether you believe Jonah was swallowed by a big fish or not. Doesn't matter. 
What matters is that you understand who Jesus is. That he's the God-man who died and arose from the dead. Now I want to talk about these two things for a minute. Uh, other great people have said, in essence, let me live and I will accomplish great things. Jesus said, I came so that I could die. Others have valued their life. Jesus valued his death. The death of Christ is mentioned 175 times in the New Testament. One out of every 44 verses. Now, what is it you need to know? about his death, for example. What is it you need to know about his resurrection? Well, let's talk about this. I have people tell me every once in a while that they have a hard time understanding the Bible. Now that's interesting. Uh, sometimes it's an archaic translation they're reading and they don't understand the old English. I, I get that. And sometimes it's not familiar with some of the historical stuff going on in the Bible, and I understand that. But what I find interesting about that comment is there are very few technical words in the Bible. You know that? You can read the Bible, and they're just very, very few. Name some technical words in the Bible. Go pick up any textbook on any subject, and you won't get very deep into it until you will run into some technical words. You want to study psychology? All right, you've got to know what a neurosis is or a psychosis. And that's only the beginning. You can't know that field without knowing a pile of technical words. Well, you could read the Bible and rarely come up with a technical word. The most difficult thing in the Bible in the words are pronouncing some of those names. Other than that, it's just real simple stuff. As a matter of fact, there's only one place where the Bible even comes close to getting technical. And it is when it uses words describing the death of Christ. This is the closest thing in the Bible to it getting technical. So I'm going to give you four words. You ready? These are the theological implications of the death of Christ. These four words have occupied the minds of some of the greatest theologians that have ever lived. But they summarize four short, simple truths. You ready for some technicalities? Here's the first one. Substitution. But it describes the fact that when Jesus died on the cross, he was our substitute. Way back in Isaiah 53, it says, The Lord has laid on him the sins of us all. 1 Corinthians chapter 15 says, Christ died for our sins. I know a man who got a doctor's degree by writing on the one preposition for, two volumes, <laughs> discussing all the theological ramifications of the fact that Jesus Christ was our substitute. Now, if you want to understand the Bible, if you want to understand who Jesus is, you've got to understand that Jesus Christ died in your place to pay for all your sins. To put it very simply, the Bible says that we've all sinned. Any arguments about that? We all agree with that? Can you believe that? A church full of sinners. Look at this. They say, you know, I don't want to go to church. There are hypocrites in it. Right. I mean, what better place for them to be? That's like saying a sick person is in ER. That's where you should be. Right. All right, we're all sinners. Have we agreed with that? All right. Now they're even confessing. Now, God says there's a penalty for that, and the penalty is yes. death. Now, think about that for a second. Think about that. The penalty is death. What did Jesus do? He died as my substitute. So instead of me standing before God and saying, God says, you have to be separated from me, which is the idea of death, 
Jesus hung on a cross and said, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? And after God put on him the sins of us all, he says, It is finished. Now that is at one and the same time the simplest truth in the Bible and the most profound. Hear me, and hear me well. Because Jesus Christ died in our place and paid for our sin, it's done. It's paid for. And I get to be forgiven not because I do something, but because he did something. Died in my place and paid for my sin. Friday, a friend of mine took me to lunch to meet some friends of his and relatives. And he paid for the lunch. Now, he's taken me to lunch before, and I've tried to pay, and he wouldn't let me. This time, he paid. He even paid the tip. Guess how much I owed when that was done? Zip. Zero. That is what Jesus did when he died. He paid for our sins, so we don't have to pay. That's substitution. The second word that you need to understand really gets close to being technical. It's, this one's used in the Bible. It's called propitiation. How's that for a 50-cent word? What is propitiation? 1 John 2, 2 says he was the propitiation not for our sins, but for the sins of the whole world. So let me exchange that 50-cent word down for a nickel word. The nickel word is satisfaction. Satisfaction. When Jesus Christ died on the cross, he satisfied the justice of God. He satisfied the wrath of God. The wrath of God on sin and the justice of God. If we had eaten at that restaurant Friday... And the proprietor said, well, hey, here's the bill. you you got to pay up. you got a debt. You owe. That would be just, would it not? I mean, he told us what the price was going to be before we said it. It was in the menu. So when my friend paid, he satisfied the just demand of the proprietor. And when Jesus hung on the cross... He satisfied the just of man of God that death be paid for sin. So if you want to understand the death of Christ, you need to understand he was our substitute and he satisfied the justice of God. To say it simply because Jesus died as a substitute for men's sins, God's wrath and justice are satisfied and therefore, therefore, people can be forgiven. There's a third word. I promised you four. We've got two. Substitute and propitiation. This one you're going to recognize. Redeemed. The Bible uses the word redemption. It talks about Jesus dying. And in that death, he redeemed us. Uh, as a matter of fact, we had a talent show Friday night. And a visitor came. Uh, and he said, what? does the Bible mean by redemption? And this was an older gentleman, and I said to him, do you remember green stamps? How many of you remember green stamps? How many of you don't know anything at all about green stamps? That's right, now, you, now we know how old you are. Well, let me explain. They used to have a thing where if you bought something, they gave you stamps. If you collected enough of them, you could go to the redemption center and buy things with the stamps. Uh, okay, they called that place a redemption center. Remember that? So here's what happens. The manufacturer of green stamps printed all these green stamps and gave them to, and gave them to merchants. And the merchants gave them to people for buy, you buy stuff and I'll give you green stamps and you get goodies at the redemption center. But the manufacturer of those deem stamps wanted their stamps back. So what did they do? They set up a redemption center and bought their stamps back and gave you a gift. That's how they bought them. Redemption is nothing more than buying back. 
The Bible says we've sinned and we became slaves of sin. So when Jesus Christ died on the cross, he bought us back from the slavery of sin. The cross is God's great redemption center. And you've got to have used green stamps to appreciate that. So, the doctrine of redemption is that because Christ died as our substitute, people's sins are paid for so that they can be freed from sin. There's one more, and this one you will understand for sure. The Bible uses this word. It says that the death of Jesus Christ reconciled us to God. So the death of Christ was a reconciliation. By our sin, we have been separated from God. When Christ died in our place to pay for our sin, we can now be reconciled to God because He paid for the sin that separates us from God. Everybody's heard about reconciliation, two people falling out and they get reconciled. You've heard of people separating married people and they get reconciled. We're used to that word. Two people who were on the outs get back together. So he says, you owe me money and because you didn't pay it, I'm not speaking to you anymore. And now they're on the outs. They need to be reconciled. So if he comes back and says, all right, I'll pay the money. Well, wow, they're reconciled. Well, that's what happened on the cross. God said, the thing that's come between me and thee is sin. And the penalty has to be paid and it's death. And Jesus Christ paid the price. And because he paid, we can be reconciled to God. That's the doctrine of reconciliation. Because Jesus died as our substitute for people's sins, the state of alienation from God is changed so that people can now be reconciled to God. Wow. Was that too bad? Did that stretch your brain just a little bit? Can you repeat those four words back to me? We're actually just talking about his death. What do we got? Substitution, propitiation, redemption, and reconciliation. Got it? Now let me show you something. Substitution is about Jesus. He was our substitute. Propitiation is about God. It satisfied his just demand that sin be paid for. Redemption is about sin. We got redeemed from sin. And reconciliation is about us. We get reconciled to God. So those four words describe the essence of Christianity and salvation. God, Christ, sin, and us. So Jesus was our substitute. And as our substitute, he satisfied God that sin had been paid for so that we could be redeemed from sin and reconciled to God. Now there is the gospel in about as complicated technical words as I can think of. That's it. You understand that? You understand the most technical, complicated stuff in the Bible. That's it. That's it. Now, there's one other thing I said that we needed to understand about Jesus concerning what he did, and that is he arose from the dead. Now, you all know this. That's, all I'm telling you is Good Friday and Easter. Just We're getting ahead of the game here. Three days after he died, he arose. His resurrection is important. It's mentioned over 100 times in the New Testament. Matter of fact, Paul said in 1 Corinthians 15 that if Jesus Christ did not come back from the dead, then our faith is vain, we're still in our sins, and none of this amounts to anything. So it is vitally important that you understand the resurrection. Simply put, Jesus Christ came back from the dead bodily. Yes. Christianity is the only religion that bases its claim on the resurrection of its founder. Mm -hmm. All other religions say, come visit the tomb 
of our founder. Christianity says, come look at the tomb. It's empty. He's not there. Here's the question. What did the resurrection of Jesus Christ accomplish? And the answer is, it obviously meant that he was alive again, but it validated Christianity. But what did it accomplish? Among other things, it provided pardon and power. The resurrection of Jesus Christ assures us of the pardon, the forgiveness of sins, the gift of eternal life. Let me see if I can explain that like this. Had Jesus remained in the grave, how would we know he paid for sin? Anybody could stand up and say, I'm going to die for your sins. How would you know if I'm telling the truth or not? I mean, there are people who die for us. Military people die for us. Policemen die for us. How do you, but suppose I say, I die for your sins. That's different. How would you know if I'm telling the truth? Well, suppose I said, I'm going to die for your sins, and three days later I'm coming back from the dead. And three days later I showed up. Would that be convincing? Get the picture? In the Old Testament, God said, I want to come dwell among you. And he set up a tent. The tent was divided into two parts, the holy place and the holy of holies. The priest went into that first compartment every day. But they were not allowed to go into that holy of holies. Only once a year, the high priest went in and offered a blood sacrifice on the altar inside that holy of holies. That was the very presence of God. But there's a tale that says, a tradition that says, that when the high priest went in to offer that, sac that blood sacrifice for the nation of Israel, that the children of Israel waited outside with bated breath, would it be accepted? Or would God kill him in his presence? Matter of fact, there is a tradition that says they actually tied a rope around his foot so that if he died, they could pull him out without having to go in and get him. To our knowledge, he always came out. And that said, God accepted the sacrifice. So as that high priest came out of the Holy of Holies, Jesus came out of the tomb said, you can rest assured that you're forgiven, that all your sins are paid for, that you can now have the gift of eternal life solely and only because of what Jesus Christ did. Now, let me mention one other thing. The resurrection of Jesus Christ provides our pardon and it provides power. Philippians 3.10 says that I may know him and the power of his resurrection. The power that it took for Jesus Christ to come out of the tomb is the same power that dwells in all those who trust Jesus Christ. He lives within us and by doing that we have within us the power to do whatever this book says not the power to do anything you want. It's the power to do what God wants you to do. So if God tells you to go love somebody and you bump into somebody you have a hard time loving, God says, I'll give you the power to do that as you depend upon me. So the resurrection of Jesus Christ assures us of pardon and the resurrection of Jesus Christ assures us of power. Wow. These two things go together, the death of Christ and the resurrection of Christ. You cannot have Christianity without having both. You just say you're going to take the teachings of Christ, you do not have biblical Christianity. You must have the death of Christ and the resurrection of Christ. Like two wings on an airplane or two tracks for a train, you must have both. All right. How are we doing here? Got it? All those technical words. 
Let me just sum it up real easy. Jesus Christ is the God-man who died for the sins of the world and bodily came back from the dead. Now, my thesis today is very simple. Jesus Christ is the most intriguing, unusual person in all of the world. Do you know anybody like him? He is God, and yet a man. He died, and yet he lives. And that's only the beginning. Much, much more could be said about this most fascinating person. Someone has put it like this. Christ's birth was not only contrary to the usual laws of life, but the power of death could not hold him. He had no cornfield or fisheries, but he could spread a table for 5,000 and have bread and fish to spare. He walked on the water of the Sea of Galilee, and they, it supported him. For just three years he preached his gospel, and when he died, few men mourned, but a black, uh, uh, black crate fell and hung over the sun. Though men trembled not for their sins, the earth beneath them shook under the load. All nature honored him. Sinners alone rejected him. Corruption could not hold his body. The soil had been reddened by his blood, could not continue to claim his dust. He wrote no books, constructed no church buildings, had no mon monastery, monetary backing. But after 1900 years, he's the one central character of all human history. He is the pivot around which the events of the ages revolve and the only regenerator of the human race. Was it not merely the son? He was not merely the son of Joseph and Mary who crossed the world horizon those many years ago. Was it just human blood that was shed on Calvary's hill? Ah, no. What thinking man could keep from exclaiming, My Lord and my God? One more time. Fascinating, isn't it? There's so much more that can be said. Volumes could be written of his ascension, intercession, return, and reign. Perhaps the most intriguing and fascinating thing of all is that he is God, and yet he wants to walk and talk with us. He lives in heaven, and yet he wants to live with and in us. He created and owns the universe, and he wants to be part of our lives. Incredible. So I want to conclude with two very simple suggestions. Number one, if you've not done so already, you need to trust Jesus Christ for the gift of eternal life. The Bible says God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. That whoever simply believes in him would not perish, but have eternal life. All you have to do to go to heaven, according to the Bible, is believe that Jesus Christ died on the cross to pay for your sin and trust him. So Friday... A friend of mine paid for lunch. And you know what I did? I've argued with him before. That's no way. I trusted him. Guess what? I got a free lunch. Can you imagine? And it was great, by the way. That's just exactly the way it is to get to heaven. I come before God and I say, what? Look at what I've done. Are you kidding me? We already agreed we're all sinners, right? So I don't care how many good things you've done. That's fine. I'm glad you've done good things. But that doesn't pay for any sins you've committed. That's like saying to the proprietor of that restaurant, do you know how many times I've paid for lunch? I'm very, I'm very pleased. I'm proud of you. I'm glad you didn't run out. But what about the, this one? And that's what God says. You've got to... 
you got to pay for the sin. And the penalty is death. And only Jesus Christ did that. So all you can do is come before God and say, Oh God, I admit I've, a, I've sinned. And I believe Jesus died for my sin and arose from the dead. And I trust him. Now let me tell you, when you do that, you establish a relationship with God. It's based on faith. All relationships are based on faith. Who are we kidding? And then what God wants you to do is, oh boy, here it comes. Do a bunch of religious things, right? I want you to be real religious. Well, that's what most people think. But you know what the Bible says? The Bible says what God wants is to walk and talk with you. That's what it says. He wants for you to abide in him. John chapter 15. He wants you just to settle down and be at home with him and talk to him all day long. It's a relationship. Christianity is not a religion. It is a relationship. Men have made it a religion. And if you read the Bible, the one thing you see very quickly is God in the form of Jesus Christ said, the one thing I'm against is religion. Jesus preached against religion more than everything else put together. Why? Because he wants a relationship. He doesn't want you to be religious. He wants you to have a relationship with him. Now, if you have the relationship, there are certain things you will do. But that's because of the relationship. Not in order to get the relationship, people get it backwards. God wants to dwell with you. That's the meaning of the word abide. Mm -hmm. So talk to him. Listen to him. Get to know him. It's fantastic. Yes. If you do what I'm saying, let me tell you what the result will be. He's going to tell us you've got to give money. Nope. He's going to tell us you've got to do religious things like go to church. Not a bad idea, but nope. I'm going to tell you what you get. Love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, and self-control. Would you like that list? That's what you get if you learn to walk with the Lord and develop the relationship with Him and not just try to be religious. He just wants to come dwell with us. That's what He said. That's why He came to earth. To die to make it possible and be raised to make it possible. So I invite you today to get to know the most intriguing person in the history of mankind. When Queen Victoria reigned in England, she occasionally visited some humble cottages of her subjects. After one such visit to a poor Christian widow, the neighbors of the widow taunted her by asking, who's the most honored guest that you've ever entertained in your home? They expected her to say Jesus because she was so religious. They recognized her deep spirituality. But to their surprise, she said, the most honored guest I've ever entertained is Her Majesty the Queen. Did you say Queen? Ah, we caught you this time. How about Jesus? You always talk about him. Isn't he the most honored guest in your home? No, indeed, she said. He's not a guest. He lives here. Let's pray.